This is the first Sunday in Lent, and today's sermon is based on the ninth chapter of Genesis, beginning with the eighth verse. Although I will here state that this morning's presentation is more of something between a lecture and a pep talk than a full-blown exegetical sermon. It's my hope that this morning we may develop a few tools, so to speak, as we spend these next few weeks of Lent dealing with what many consider to be difficult passages, I believe we will need some tools to make sense of what these texts possibly have to say to us today. So, here's our text for this morning. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I will establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant as between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. We're looking this morning at the story of Noah and the ark, or more specifically, we're examining the immediate aftermath. There are a number of ways we can look at this story. The first, of course, is to do what I was taught as a young person, to simply take it at face value as an account, however implausible, of history. That at some point in the past, God became so upset with his creation that he decided to simply wipe it out and start over again with the exception of eight people. Now, taking this story literally presents a number of logical problems for the reader. There are the scientific problems. Where, for example, did all this water come from and where did it ultimately go? If the earth was totally covered with water so that even the highest mountain ranges, some five miles above sea level, were engulfed, that's the entire world under five miles of water. What would that do to the earth's orbital trajectory? What would that kind of pressure do to the plant life below that was ultimately going to be reborn? How did the seeds of the plants survive for so long in what we can assume was at least brackish water, the oceans having mixed with the freshwater. How did the freshwater fish survive in all this brackish water? Or the saltwater fish in the saline depleted brackish water? And the list of basic scientific questions goes on and on. But more disturbing to me, is this how we want to think about God? As some sort of celestial spoiled child who destroys a toy that is not performing the way he wants? Or maybe as a frustrated, moody sculptor whose latest creation is not coming out the way he wants? It's not working, so I'll smash it and start all over again. 
And if God is actually like that, what becomes of omniscient or all-wise? The lead-up to the story of the Ark says that God repented of the fact that he had made man. Repented? But isn't God perfect? How then could God make a mistake? Particularly so large a mistake as this. It seems that the list of theological questions posed by the story of Noah and the Ark is just as long and frustrating as the list of scientific questions. On the other hand, we might, perceiving the logical quandaries created by a literal interpretation, simply dismiss the story as the imaginings of primitive man in an attempt to explain what was then unexplainable. Why, for example, do we find fish fossils on the top of mountains or in the middle of a desert? Answer, there must have been water there once, a great flood. Truth be told, the world's cultures are full of deluge myths. To name just a few, the Samarian creation myth is essentially a flood story involving a primordial world that is wiped out by a flood with only the animals and the seed of mankind preserved to create the world in which we now reside. The Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh contains a similar flood myth. There are flood myths in ancient Greek mythology and similar deluge stories from Africa, India, and Native American cultures. The list goes on. The idea of life emerging or otherwise being reborn from water seems a recurrent cultural trope. Now, to those of you who follow my teaching, it's no secret that I consider the Hebrew flood story, Noah and the Ark, to be a myth. Specifically, as I mentioned in last week's improvisation blog, I consider the story on an anthropological level, to be a type of creation story, as the flood myths of other cultures are often actually creation stories, the world moving from some primordial, often chaotic state to the more normative state in which we now live. But all of this begs the question, what do we do with it? Do we ignore scientific evidence, and take it as an alternative history for the faithful, much as some do with what are more typically understood to be the creation accounts at the beginning of Genesis. You might do that, but I hope that you will not. We might also, as mentioned, simply dismiss the whole thing as a fanciful attempt to explain the unexplainable, and then just move on. But I hope you won't do that either. Instead, I am hoping you will use this story and other difficult or otherwise implausible scriptural stories as a kind of springboard for your understanding of humankind's relationship to God and your own relationship to the Creator. A couple of basic premises for understanding. I hold that the Bible is not so much a record of what God has done, but rather a record of one particular culture or group of closely related cultures' attempt to understand God and their own place in the world. The Bible was not, as theologian Michael Harden sometimes quips, divinely downloaded into the brains of the scribes. Neither was it dictated to human writers by God. As such, the Bible is as much an anthropological book as it is a spiritual one. The Bible seems to contain a growing and broadening understand of God and humanity. Yet the trajectory of this understanding is far from linear. Sometimes it seems like we will encounter a very enlightened, by our own estimation, understanding. 
And then there is an often terrible, equally by our understanding, regression into an often cruel primitivism. That having been said, I believe we may find the voice of God within what we call Scripture if we listen with both cultural and spiritual humility. So our text for this morning. It seems rather shocking in a way, even disturbing. Still reading somewhat literally, at the onset, God becomes angry. We read in Genesis 6, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. And so the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. And so God does, except for Noah and his family, and a sampling of the birds and land-based animals. Some have suggested this colossal punishment is the result of a particularly colossal sin, interpreting the beginning of Genesis 6, which reads, When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be one hundred twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man and then bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Some interpret this as meaning intercourse between angels or other heavenly beings and humans, giving rise to a race of hybrid mighty men. Now, there are a few problems with this interpretation, but I thought I'd mention it as a point of interest. Regardless of the reason, God becomes enraged and sets out to destroy his own handiwork, that same handiwork which he pronounced good because of man's evil, despite saying that man, initially, was very good. But by the time we get to chapter 9, God seems to have had a change of heart. In fact, he almost doesn't seem to be the same deity. He makes a covenant of peace between himself and Noah, the new father of the human race. So an agreement between God, and not just the chosen people, but all of humanity, in fact, humanity and the animals and the birds. A dramatic change of heart, to say the least. But if we step back and realize this is a story, similar to stories found in many cultures, human beings made this story to explain things. The aforementioned fish remains in the middle of the desert, and why there are rainbows in the sky, and where we come from. The story also presents two views of God, one angry and even capricious, the other rescuing the faithful from the hands of the violent, and ultimately establishing peace between himself and all people. We could almost have some sympathy for second-century theologian Marcion, who suggested that there were in fact two gods, and the god of the Old Testament was not the same as Jesus Abba. So where do these understandings of God come from? Of course, they derive from our experiences and our desires. In short, we make our gods, if not in our own image, at the very least after our own imaginings. Clearly the flood story depicts a god of violence, like ourselves, frustrated and desperate when things spin out of control. But at the end, 
it depicts a god we would most likely much rather worship, one who is fatherly in his love of creation, gentle in his establishment of peace. And that brings me to the final, for now at least, premise. The work of theology is not complete. We are still striving to understand God and to understand our place before God and our place in the universe. Perhaps that work will never be complete any more than the work of any science is truly ever done. Whether science or theology, as we answer questions, new questions present themselves. But then when we recognize all of this as a journey, how exhilarating the questions can become. In today's text, I suggest we look at the image, or images of God, presented as a growing understanding, where we move from an understanding of a violent God to a God of peace. Once we are freed from the idea of the capricious, spoiled child-like deity, we may begin to see the flood myth on a new metaphorical level, perhaps as emblematic of leaving a world of violence behind, as symbolic of placing one's trust in God's guidance. The Ark itself becomes a metaphor for many things, perhaps the enclosure of God's love, or even, as the doors of the Ark are opened again, of stepping out of the gloom of death into the brightness of new life. But then, of course, if we still find attachment to the idea of the punishing God, then we must ask ourselves, why? What is it about this concept that we like so much? Whom do we want to see punished, and why? For, again, we will continue to imagine a God whose moral compass doubles our own. But don't take my word for it. As we continue to move through the season of Lent, as we continue to study difficult passages, for example, next week, the story of Abraham and Isaac, as we study and contemplate, and as you simply live endeavoring to follow Jesus, how does the voice of God speak to you? How do you perceive where and how he calls you? The study of scripture is in that respect no different from life. We must sift through it to find God's voice and God's leading as we move along the ways of life, light, love, and peace. Mm -hmm.